So, Scott, good to see you again. Uh, I've been seeing this stuff on Skype, as I said, and um, this is basically what Sangha is really all about, is that mutual cooperation. And I wanted to congratulate you for that. And then you told me a story about um, being in the gym where someone wanted you to, to leave his space and got angry at you. And there you went along, go along to get along. He invited you to get angry, so you got angry. Or another way of saying it, you didn't even think that you owned the place until he came and told you you didn't own it. And now all of a sudden you do own it. Yeah. Why else would you get angry? Because you think that he's taking something away from you. So, in fact, one of the ways of looking at it is, is that his anger was basically because he was disappointed or he was fearful of having lost something. And because you were using it, he thought he had lost it. Right? To where, in fact, you weren't really attached to it that much anyway until you found out that he wanted it. In fact, I've yeah, seen that yeah. in, in um, uh, uh, let us say, daycare and primary school, or not even primary school, but really younger than that, the age of two or three. And a child is looking around and seeing the other children playing with toys, and instead of going and finding a toy to play with, he wants to go take a toy away from one of the other kids. Oh, that kid's having so much fun with that toy. Let me go have that fun with that toy, too. Never mind that kid. All right. So, in fact, this guy in the gym is still in diapers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If he wants to play with the toy that you're playing with, and he's got a whole gym full of toys to play with. It's really funny when you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's really young stuff, is being jealous of somebody because they're enjoying themselves, uh, taking something that, uh, that he probably didn't even want it until he saw you using it. Hmm. And so uh, what we need in our practice is to be able to see that stuff by looking at it, and we have to remember to look at it. And when we look at it, we can see that kind of behavior and we can recognize, oh, I've got a choice here about how I'm going to deal with this grown man in diapers. <laughs> Maybe the right thing to do is to just let him go do what he wants to do and just walk just away. Walk away. Yeah. yeah, let him have it. Yeah. That in fact, uh, in the in the daycare, I would say that the wise little kid would be the one who lets the bully have the toy and go play with something else. I mean, if I can enjoy one teddy bear, I'm going to enjoy another one. Or if I've got one talking truck and he wants that talking truck, then I can go play with the choo-choo instead. So that's kind of wisdom to recognize I can be satisfied with whatever I'm doing. But most children are not that way. We get attached to, oh, I like this toy and I want to keep it because I like it. And so you were in diapers also. Yeah. I was an angry little baby. <laughs> like <laughs> Just throwing a temper tantrum, right? It's like exactly. very, kind of childish. Uh-huh. And so when we wake up and laugh about it like that, we say, hey, you know, I don't have to behave that way anymore. I've got a choice. I don't have to do it the way that I've been doing it all these years. The kind of behavior that I learned when I was three. But now I can learn that. And you see, probably that's been happening all throughout school where you would get in confrontations with guys because you both wanted the same thing, the same seat, the same book, the same girl, the same teacher. It doesn't matter what it is. We always want whatever somebody else has got. Mm -hmm. And we learned that behavior in diapers. Yeah. And here we see Putin doing the same thing. Putin's still <laughs> in diapers. <laughs> yeah. The big man, baby. Uh-huh. Yeah.
So the question is, can we wake up to that diaper laden behavior that we have? Can we see that we can act adults rather than uh, acting confrontation and, and owning things and, and what like, like that? Because that's the reality, in fact, in daycare is, is that neither one of those little boys owned that Tonka truck. Or in your case, the gym, neither one of you owns that gym equipment. The gym guy, the owner of the gym owns that equipment. It belongs to him. If, you, if he wants to use that equipment while he's in the gym, right, he's got to have a membership or whatever, but he can't pick up that dumbbell or that uh, uh, weightlifting set or whatever like that and go put it in the trunk of his car and drive off. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to him. Yeah, just like that little Tonka truck does not belong to the three year old. It belongs to the um, uh, uh, the daycare. Mm -hmm. If we get that kind of attitude about everything and recognize I don't really own anything. And I'm much better off without having to own anything because anything that I own, I've got to take care of. And anything that I own and have to be taken care of means that when I lose it, I've got to fight to keep it. That there is grief in the things that we lose. That reminds me of uh, the teaching of uh, Meister Eckhart, who says, uh -huh. uh, uh, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven." Or like to be poor in spirit is supposed to mean like should not own anything, like not take ownership over anything, like to to not take anything as personal. Mm hmm. And then that's like heaven, right? Right. When you don't own anything, then you don't have to take care of anything. And you don't have to get punished for it breaking because it doesn't belong to you. You're not responsible for that. And so this is a new kind of attitude that we can take is, is that we don't own things. I just had a long conversation with a dude that was kind of upset with Ukraine and Putin and all of that kind of stuff and trying to tell this guy, yeah, Putin is doing what Putin is doing because Putin is terrified of losing something that Putin thinks he owns. And he, if he were not terrified, he, he would not use his army to invade Ukraine. It's because he's terrified. Now, there's no reason for you and I to be terrified because Putin is terrified. Mm -hmm. But the Ukrainian people take care of Putin. They could do it quite nicely, it looks. They don't need our help. They don't need us to go over and fight with them in Ukraine. So why do they need us to go over there in our own minds and fight? That's a, that's the way of looking at it is, is that things like that are not our business. But that gym equipment is not your business. If you're occupying the space that he wants you to move, you can get up and move. There's no problem with that. That's the easy way out. That's as the opposed easy way to, out. Yeah, that's what that's a neat, a really interesting way of thinking about it because in our society we're not supposed to take the easy way out. <laughs> the reality is is that the easy way out, if we keep taking the easy way out every time we go, then we really never do have any problems because we've always got it easy. Because we're in the <laughs> habit of being easy. Yeah. That's a better way to live, right? Uh-huh. Definitely. But in our society is, is that all oh, easy, like pride go, if, if you don't take care of your business for me, then when that business is not taken care of, I'll blame you. And the answer to that is, well, you can blame whoever's in front of you, but I've just taken a hike. That you can't blame me because it didn't belong to me in the first place. Um, I had a friend here, his name is Greg, and we've developed a, uh, 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 a phrase of not my business, M -R -N -M -B. <laughs> NMB, not my business. Not my business. Hmm? Yeah, that's another good way to put it. It's, it's... So Putin is not my business. Democratic Party, not my business. Republican Party, not my business. Yeah, or if someone <laughs> comes up to you because they're miserable and angry. That's not my business. That's not my business. Yeah. 
That's a new way of looking because we've been taught in our society that everything is your business. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. You should get involved. We need voters. <laughs> we need volunteers. Yeah, we need a draft. We got to get everybody over there to Vietnam so that we could all feel bad together. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was in I was in the military for like a year and I just couldn't see myself like it didn't align with my virtues. Like I get, I went to the the Air Force Academy. So it was like a school that when you graduate you become an officer. Colorado. But, yes, I know. Yeah, but before the Air Force before, Academy is in Boulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 before you get to the two year mark, uh you have the option of leaving. Like you you're you're not like in the contract. And then I was just like looking at the different like jobs I could be assigned to. And one of them would just be like sitting in a bunker somewhere, deciding whether someone lives or dies behind a screen, like drone striking people. And I just cannot imagine doing that. Like I wouldn't be able to live, my, live with myself if I did that. Uh. Yes, um, the Buddha would recommend in all cases to remain aloof and separated from militias, military, organized groups that have weapons mm. to stay away from not only the weapons, but the people who have them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we don't need weapons. We don't need defensive weapons. We don't we don't need. I mean, yeah, a pocket knife will do. Because you can clean your fingernails and do all kinds of little things with a pocket knife, but you don't carry a saber. Because that's saber. like a more that's like a more Christ like approach, right? To like turn the other cheek or like not to um take up arms and uh commit violence. Ah uh, yes. Crusaders for Christ. They don't do that. Yeah. They do Jesus says to do. Yes, I know. Isn't that crazy? Why do people kill each other over a message that's about not killing each other? That blows my mind. Ah, <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the message of Jesus is actually quite clear in the sense of the golden rule, agape love, brotherhood, mm -hmm. friendship, companionship. The Buddha is actually very big on that too, in the sense of Sangha, of mm -hmm. being able get along with each other but you could say that that the jesus approach is is that you start on the outside to become friends with other people and then eventually it filters on to the inside so that you become friends with yourself guess what it never works if you're not a friend with yourself on the inside that is very hard for to be friends with people on the outside for instance it That's was true. very hard for you to do the friendly thing with this guy and just walk away from him and say the place is yours have at That's it true. i'm out of here <laughs> yeah no you had to own it you had to get it you had to become part of it okay well that's the problem with christianity is they keep wanting you to join this that and the other thing mm. okay evangel the evangelical like aspect of it mm -hmm. right? they to call convert. it a movement by the way and i haven't seen it move anywhere in the past <laughs> seven years <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the other way of doing it, which is the Buddhist approach, is let's start looking at not cleaning up everything within one's mind, but at least cleaning up what's happening right now. Let's just clean this up right now. Let's just do this right now. And pretty soon we get into the habit of cleaning up what's happening right now. And we begin to gain confidence that we can. And so we become on guard and we get to the point that things are really good right now on the inside. It's only from that friendship or nurturing or unification of the mind that we have on the inside do we ever have a hope of being able to have sangha or camaraderie or people actually having the golden rule. 
In other words, uh, I, I need to find out the golden rule for myself of treat myself the way that I would want to be treated rather than treating myself the way that I've been told to treat myself by all of the other people who were treating me the way that they were told to treat me. Mm. So the golden rule can be applied first on the inside to start nurturing ourselves rather than being critical of ourselves, to start enjoying being alive. I mean, being alive is quite nice. There's nothing and, like it. No, well, death is certainly not. <laughs> yeah. But being knowing that one is alive. That's also, I mean, you can be dead to the world in in sense of sleep, and then you don't even know that you're alive, or you could be in a coma. But to know that you're alive also has various degrees. And when we are uh, standing and arguing with someone over a piece of gym equipment, that somehow or another we feel uh, because the gym equipment is threatened, I am threatened. And therefore, there is fear here. And the fear then is almost proof positive that we hold life itself as dear because we have fear. If we had absolutely no fear, then life would mean nearly as much to us. So now that we actually recognize how dear life is to us, why don't we really actually intentionally start enjoying it? I mean, the, the the father says that his daughter is dear to him, but if he doesn't call her, doesn't check in on her, doesn't pay attention to her, doesn't give her gifts and, and nice things and whatnot like that, then his dearness doesn't really mean anything. So uh, when we talk about dear life, for most of us, life is really not that dear. That that piece of gym equipment is more important than me being alive somehow. <laughs> <laughs> until this angry guy actually does threaten our existence and then we get straightened out to recognize oh wait a minute it's not the gym equipment that i'm about to lose it's my own life that i'm about to lose well guess what you're about to lose that precious life in the next two minutes if you don't breathe if you don't breathe you're going to die so maybe it would be a good idea to say, at least if this is my last breath, let me enjoy this one. That I can begin to enjoy this breath because it's keeping me alive. It's my death sentence uh, being postponed. And I'm alive. Marvelously alive. And I could breathe to prove it to myself that I am alive. That's the most beautiful experience. To just enjoy the breath. That it's, if you want to say it in magical or um, religious terms, it's the best gift that you have ever been given is this breath of life. But it wasn't God that gave you that gift. It was your mom and pop off having a ball or two. That's what gave you life. So we could thank biology itself. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> but we can't think or we can't uh, feel gratitude towards a magical concept. Oh, yeah. Which is God. God's just a magical concept. But being alive is real. Taking a breath. Being alive is real. Mm -hmm. But even like my, you can't give the credit to your parents because your parents are just uh, doing what they naturally do. And then well, I was created on my own. Exactly. Exactly. Like so they took it the... was just a series of events. It's just the natural process of things. That's where we all come from is mm -hmm. we're all just born into existence due to circumstances. <clears throat> but we can be grateful that those circumstances actually existed. The Buddha is actually quite big on uh, giving mom especially credit. 
um, <clears throat> that in fact, uh, to become a monk at any age, one either has to have his mother's permission or she's dead. One or the other. Mm, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. That you have to have your mom's permission. We see in Thailand, that's easy peasy. The moms are actually pushing some of their young men in to <laughs> become a monk. Uh, and there's all kinds of magical stories about that the, when the monk, when her son ordains, she's in heaven or she gets a ticket to heaven. Well, guess what? In that ordination ceremony, she's the star of the show. She is in heaven. There are more women paying attention to her than they are paying attention to the actual ordination. She's the mom here. And so that's a very powerful also experience. Um, my mom enjoyed that when I was a monk in the United States because most of the time monks there, they didn't have their moms there to pay respect to. And so they paid respect to my mom instead. That's part of the Buddhist culture is how uh, respectful we are uh, and giving thanksgiving to the fact that I wouldn't be here if you hadn't been screwing around. Now, I have a question about uh, your mom. Did your mom ever um, listen to your teachings or did you ever teach to your mom? For about 25 years. Okay. Yeah, we, just... because she was the kind of Christian that darkened the door of every church. She was the one who had the key. She's not mm. the one who was waiting for the door open. She was there to open the door. <laughs> That's the kind of Christian she was. Oh, okay. Yeah, my I try I try to teach some of the stuff to my mom. Um, she's very Christian, so like, I just try to find ways to put it that like. Um, well, like make sense to her like in the moment um mm -hmm. so i try not to like create too much like um uh arguments although sometimes i am guilty of doing that of like arguing about uh religion and stuff like that well don't don't argue about religion because yeah. she's not there what you can say is things that jesus said mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's what i found better. Okay, stay with that stay with what More jesus helpful. had to say yeah 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 OK, um, <clears throat> that in fact, going back and learning some verses. Mm -hmm. So that you can pull that trick on her. I mean, this is quoting of, of Jesus, like the, the ye shall know Jesus the truth. Jesus has some it, good quotes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they've become very uh, well accepted in our society, which makes them even better. So people just agree to it. Yeah. Uh huh. But then there's the ones that are more uh, obscure, like the birds have their nest and the fox have their fields, but the son of man has no place to rest his head. Do you know that? That sounds like a, a koan almost, like something no, that you that's actually a quote from Jesus. And he's the son of man, you see, because the, the Jews in the time the Israelites or whatever uh, word that they would call themselves, they thought of themselves as the children of God. Mm -hmm. And they talk about Jesus as being the son of God, the very big dude son of God, right? But mm -hmm. Jesus referred to himself as son of man. Kind of turning that stuff upside down, and yet the Christians keep putting it up backwards again. I think there's another Jesus quote where it says, um, the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the ends of the earth, but men no. do not see it. Or no, is that not a right quote? No, that's not a right quote. What Jesus said, and it's in actually in uh, uh, Luke chapter 17, and it's got a whole context to it. Because um, he was actually teaching the kids and the Pharisees, you know, the temple owners, because he's on the temple steps, and they come up and start giving him a hard time about when is it going to happen and where is it going to be and where is the kingdom of God and all of this. He was saying, the kingdom of God is within you. Hmm. So that's one that you can use with mom. That Listen, if you're interested in anything that Christianity has to teach, recognize that it's within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And that's that's very similar to the Buddha saying, uh, "Be a light unto yourself." Or is yes. that 
the similar okay mm -hmm. well everything is on the inside mm -hmm. your heaven and your hell is on the inside it's not out in outer space or deep under the dirt oh yeah, yeah. your heaven and your hell is between your ears And when somebody Christian comes up and says, oh, no, hell's a real place. And the answer to that is for you right now, it is. You're conceptualizing mm. hell right now, and there you are in it. Now, I was going to ask you what you think about um, the Buddhists, like uh, 31 planes of existence, like the the idea that there's like like higher realms of like, uh, that's not David. actually buddhist oh, okay because i was hearing that, uh, some teachings about that well that's not buddhist that's some people who brought that stuff with them and it probably pre-existed buddha but that the hindus forgot all about it but somehow or another the buddhists kept it written down and so they think that it's buddhist where in fact no heavens and hells and all planes of existence is just more magical thinking that the buddha recommends you come out of hmm. those what places don't exist for you right now so why do you think about them right now if there is a 31th level of existence why don't you wait until you get there and then take a look around investigate it find out what's there until then you're not there so why give it a thought Give a thought yeah. to what's happening right here, right now. <laughs> yeah, that's the Dharma, right? Yeah. That's the Dharma. Well, I, the, it is interesting to me because um, the way he was like teaching it was that he was saying, oh, there's beings in these higher realms that even in, if they're like, there's a realm correlated to every jhana and like their nervous system is just wired for that jhana and their perpetual. Yeah, the ordinary yeah. mind just goes all over the place inventing crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just mental speculations, all of it. That's true. Now, it's a specu How would you know that? Yeah, that's like, what? Mm -hmm. Just speculation, dreaming up things. And the guys who were dreaming that up don't even know that they're dreaming it up. They think because they dropped it up, it must be real because it's their thoughts. Uh. Rather than thinking, oh, that's just another thought. Yeah, 31 levels, this, that, and the other thing. So <laughs> what? That's not my business. <laughs> that's really funny. Well, you can also see that with the idea of uh, these, these 31 levels of existence and all that are deeply, deeply tied to the belief in reincarnation. Mm. To where the Buddhist teaching is rebirth in this moment. You are reborn in that hell. You are reborn in that 31th degree right here and now. That is not reincarnation. That in fact, whatever it is that's reincarnated, don't, that don't exist. So another way of looking at reincarnation is also not about a, a planes of existence, but let us think about it in the sense of deep, dark past and deep, dark futures, because those 31 planes of heavens and whatnot is way off in the deep, dark future, right? So, what we're practicing is to be here now. Not be here 10 minutes ago, not be here now two hours ago, not be here now five years ago, to not be here now 20 years ago or even a thousand years ago so past lives mean nothing whether that past life was while you were shaving this morning or not or you were shaving 10,000 years ago with a stone axe those things don't matter right now what matters right now is how does the face feel right now How does the face feel right now? Never mind what face it was 10,000 years ago. That's irrelevant. Just like those planes of existence, they're all irrelevant. And that they are nothing more than concepts in the mind. For instance, you probably remember something that happened 
when you were, say, 10 years old? Maybe a bicycle accident, or maybe you got called down in school, or some kind of dukkha happens when you're 10 years old and we remember it. But when we're remembering it now, that's just a concept. Because you don't know whether it actually really happened or not. There's no evidence for it. That bicycle is gone. That teacher is gone. That school is gone. There's nothing left of it. There's no way to verify that episode that happened when I was 10 years old. It's just a concept now in my mind. And it has no more existence than what happened in a past life 300 or 3,000 years ago. Those are still just concepts. So that's your answer about that 31 planes of existence. They're just concepts. It's like something the mind dreamt up, like the dreaming mind. mind. And like waking up means waking up into like reality. This is it. This is reality. Mm -hmm. This is it. It's like it's true beyond a shadow of a doubt. Like you can't, you don't have to like imagine it. Well, we take it in with the senses. Hmm. Well, now, but like also the the something that at first at first I thought like in Buddhism, like the idea of the jhanas, like I thought they were made up too, but then I realized that it's actually something you could experience for yourself. So that's a little bit yeah. Yes, different. that's exactly correct. That for most people, jhanas are magical painting. And including when they're in the jhana, that's still magical faking. But there is certain things that is an actual first jhana, and it actually has either, depending upon the way you describe it, either five or six constituent components. That sixth component we'll talk about in a moment. But the first component is that the mind is free from dukkha. The mind is free in this moment from the hindrances. The mind is free from unwholesome thoughts. That is is either a true fact or not a fact. You have a control over how you're going to feel. In other words, uh, our, our thought and the kind of thinking that we have in this moment can either be very small in the sense of real because reality is quite small to where the lies are huge. An example of that is I ask you how old you are. You, If you're going to tell me the truth, you've just got one answer. But if I ask you how old you are over and over and over again, and you keep lying to me over and over again, there's no end to how many different ages you can be, right? So lies are just completely overwhelming the truth. So that means that we need to be careful about what kind of thoughts we have, because most likely it's going to be a lie, is we're just dreaming stuff up. But the first jhana has that quality of you're having a um, a wholesome, real thought right now, and you know that it's real. So freedom from hindrances is the first one. And the kind of language that we're using then is going to be applied and sustained thought. We're going to apply it to the wholesome and sustain it on the wholesome. It keeps sustaining uh, wholesome thoughts gladdening the mind and as we sustain on the wholesome thoughts and gladdening the mind we be, become uh we start to feel as good as we're thinking so we think ourselves into feeling we have actually been thinking and talking ourselves into feeling bad our whole lives now it's time to start talking and thinking ourselves into feeling really good and so by talking ourselves into feeling good, we begin to feel good. And now we're developing more of the jhana factors. And when we get really good at this over and over again and in practicing it so that we feel good and we feel good and we feel good, then we begin to develop the attitude, I can do this. And now we're adding another ingredient to it. And that is now no longer do we have just success, or excuse me, just satisfaction. But now we're adding to it the feeling of success. I've got this. Similar to the feeling that the uh, uh, quarterback has just when he's making a touchdown. What's the first thing that the quarterback does when he is, you know, in the all-star The victory dance. Yeah, the victory (laughs) dance. So we need to find a victory dance in our mind. 
that's that victory dance is the uh, first jhana. That feeling of victory dance mentally. I use, I know the feeling. I used to play sports. When you score that goal, you yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we need you now that you know what and remember what that feeling is like. Keep bringing it up. Keep feeling that way. Become uh, a champion that way to feel like the lion. Yeah, I got this. Yeah, I can do that. Also, um, what do you say like about if someone says to you, um, I've had this a conversation before that they think they somehow managed to get into first jhana, but then they they're somehow convinced that uh, first jhana is awakening or first is like they like deluded themselves into thinking that there is no nibbana. Well, you can question them, ask them a bunch of questions. Like, what is first jhana? What are the constituent components of first jhana? How do you feel when you're in first jhana? What are you thinking about when you're in first jhana? And why aren't you in first jhana right now? If if first jhana was an awakening, why didn't you stay awake? Why did you go back to sleep now that you're having this conversation with me? You're getting actually pissed off because I'm asking you all the right questions. Right. So you just proved to me that you're not in first jhana, and which meant that when you were in first jhana, it was meaningless. It didn't mean a thing. Exactly. Yes. What what matters is right now, not what happened last week or the first jhana's first term. You don't yeah. care about it. That's in the past. You've lost it. Sorry. It's gone. It's in the past. Is it your jhana, your first jhana is as dead meat <laughs> as your mis. <laughs> <laughs> but you could do that in a humorous way so that they get the point yeah i'm not in first jhana right now so it must have not been that a big a deal let me get back into first jhana now and then it will be a big deal now that's that's a good litmus test for awakening is asking where is it right now? Where, where is, is your it? Where is your awakening <laughs> right now? If you're talking about something you experienced in the past, that's not <laughs> it. Like, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that so liberating? That's just, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. All we've got is right now. The past doesn't exist. But we also in our culture are very landmark or milestone oriented. Rather than recognizing that the mind can be all over the place, we think that the mind is in a progression. Almost, in fact, the um, uh, the big mistake that Westerners make with Buddhism is by calling the Eightfold Noble whatever a path because it's not a path. It's not going any place. It's stopping from going any place. In fact, why don't we call it the Eightfold Noble Roadblock? <laughs> just stop already. <laughs> stop it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just stop already. You're not going anywhere. I like that, the Eightfold Noble Roadblock. <laughs> really throws a wrench in things. <laughs> like I love that quote that you said it has been such a profound quote that your teacher told to you that you said you said if at first you don't succeed try try again and he said uh, if at first you don't succeed look at what you're doing, what you're doing. <laughs> that's revol that's a revolutionary quote like that's like <laughs> because we've been taught we've been taught to just keep doing the same things that have the same outcome over and over instead of looking oh oh we're doing that wrong and changing it mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the essence of buddhism and bhikkhu buddha dasa gave me that and it just was just rolled off his tongue with a chuckle <laughs> not knowing how many people would benefit from that one remark he made it's a good one yeah So if at first you don't succeed, look at what you're doing. Exactly. 
which means uh, if at first you didn't succeed with this guy who wanted your gym equipment, look at what you're doing. Oh, he wants it. Let him have it. And that would have been even easier. Okay, I think that's a good note to end it. It's been a great talk. <laughs> great, Scott. Thank you. Yeah. This has been Thank really great. Thank you so great. much. I, yeah, I loved it. Enjoyed it <laughs> so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, Scott. We'll see you later. See you next Thanks time. Thanks for calling. Okay. Bye-bye.